<laughs> I am what fuels nightmares. Here at escrow, you've released your loan contingency. You've already told your mom you're buying a house. You've posted it on Facebook. You've scheduled the housewarming party. You've told your friends. You even texted your ex to let them know you're a homeowner now, and they missed out breaking up with you. And then you get the call from me. Sorry, sir. It turns out your loan is not approved. I set you up with a loan officer who doesn't know what they're doing and told you what you wanted to hear. Your deposit is at risk, your pride is at risk, and your reputation within the real estate community hangs in the balance. Do you want to avoid being in a situation like this yourself? We came to the right place. In today's episode of Mortgage Monday, Christian and I are going to be sharing mortgage nightmares and more importantly, what you can do to avoid them and make your real estate dreams come true instead. Let's get it. Christian Bachelor, welcome to Mortgage Mondays. How are you today? Pretty good. Pretty good. Got a good episode in store for you all today. Yes, we do. We are going to be talking about mortgage mishaps. People that have come across our brokerage after royally screwing everything up and we fixed it. And now we are going to tell you so that you don't make mortgage mistakes and you keep yourself out of trouble. I mean, it's nice when you can save one, but it's better to never end up in that position in the first place. I know you did a lot of jujitsu when you were younger, Christian. And oftentimes students will ask the teacher, how do you get out of this position, which is almost always impossible. And they'll say, you don't ever get into it. And here's how you avoid ever getting into it. So that's what we're talking about today, how to not end up in somebody else's rear naked choke and be begging for relief. All right. Example number one is somebody who used the wrong loan to start. So this was a client who went to a lender. They were trying to do a fix and flip. They had a great property. They had a great deal on it. They were using a normal loan to buy the property. And then they were going to use their money to fix that property up. The problem is they didn't have a ton of their own money. So they were doing bare bones renovations and then something went wrong and they crossed our path and you were able to put them into a unique loan product that is meant for fix and flips. Can you tell us a little bit about that story? Yeah, it's exactly right. And, and this borrower, you know, is interesting because he actually had pretty good experience as a, uh, as a fix and flipper, I guess you can call him. He had been utilizing fully underwritten conventional type loans to acquire these properties, which is good in terms of interest rate because those come with lower holding costs. But he was not taking advantage of the higher leverage that a fix and flip loan could get. For an example, he was putting, you know, the standard 20% down, sometimes even 25% down with bank products to purchase a property. And then he was paying for all the renovation out of his pocket. Okay. So he, he had done a number of these. I think he had done 15, 20 flips and he came to us and said, Hey, I'm, I'm really starting to hit kind of like a stalemate with my growth. I can only have two or three of these going at a time because I have to outlay so much money for the renovations, right? Not only do I have to come in with the 20 to 30% down, but I also have to pay for all of the renovations out of pocket and it's starting to really take a hit to my capital, right? I just don't have enough money to continue making offers and I want to grow and scale. I got a good team. I got a good acquisition strategy of finding these properties. You know, I can get good rates in terms of materials. I just don't have enough money to keep these going. We did a little analysis and realized, hey, you're actually expensing more money on the cheaper loan which is the conventional loan product because your rates is lower, right? Your holding costs are less, but you're expensing more money up front. Why don't we pivot you over to a loan intended for fix and flips where you put 20% down on the purchase and we were actually able to get him 100% of his renovation finance. And he was doing projects that were 100 and $150,000 sometimes. So you think of that, each loan that he's taking on, he's also expensing 100 to $200,000 of renovation out of pocket. You know, he was flipping big properties, six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars $800,000 homes, right? So I mean, this cash outlay was getting significant significant for every project. And the difference that saving that renovation cost kept in his pocket allowed him to put an extra two or three properties under contract at a time, which allowed him to scale his portfolio, get his team paid you know, quickly. He's got more capital to hire people, really kind of put him on the fast track to success. And he didn't even know these products existed. So the lesson there is use the appropriate loan product for the intended result. Not all loans are the same. Just because somebody is going to give you money doesn't mean that that's the best tool to use for the job. Number Number two, we have the case of the self-sufficiency rule. So this was a buyer who is buying a small multi
multifamily property. I don't remember the details. You probably will if it was a duplex, triplex, or fourplex. But in the middle of escrow, they found out about the self-sufficiency rule, which blew up the opportunity to buy. Can you share a little bit about the details of this one? Yeah, absolutely right. And this was a triplex for reference. This bar was interesting. So he got pre-approved with us. First time home buyer, wanted to buy a multifamily, wanted to do the typical house hack strategy. Um, this was in California, so high cost of living area. And we gave him a pre-approval and we said, you can buy a duplex, but if you get into a triplex with an FHA loan, you're not going to be able to do this. It won't work with this self-sufficiency rule. We let him know that. He ended up going to another lender who told him, you can do it. Absolutely. You're within your qualified metrics. Your debt to income is good. The property looks good. And this loan officer did not know about the self-sufficiency rule. This was a historically, typically conventional lender, and they didn't really have a lot of experience with FHA, specifically with multifamily FHA. So this borrower went and put this property in contract. Um, The loan officer told him it's looking great, moving along quickly. They got their appraisal ordered. He paid a lot of the expenses for inspection and appraisal. And it actually came down to the day where he was supposed to waive his loan contingency, right? And for those buyers out there, you guys know what that means. That means your deposit is, is now gone. Right. If you don't close, you, you're, you're waiving your right to get your refund for your deposit. And of course, the loan officer waited till that day to tell him, "Uh oh, we are not in a good spot. We have a uh, problem with your file. We ran into this FSH self-sufficiency rule. I was not aware this was going to happen. I thought it would be clear. He ended up calling us back and said, Christian, you guys were right. You guys called exactly what would happen. What was your alternative? Because I have one day to decide now. And we actually did the right thing. This was recently. So we flipped him to the new product that we've made a couple of bigger pockets, Mortgage Monday's uh, post about. Um, we flipped him to the 5% down conventional multifamily loan. Does not have that self-sufficiency rule requirement. He had to put that extra 1.5% down. But when he really did the math, I believe he had a thirty dollars or $40,000 deposit out there. It made a lot more sense to bring up an extra 1.5% down, right? So a little bit larger down payment. But man, losing that forty grand would have really sucked. Right. So we were able to save them money. They transferred the appraisal over to us and we closed with the product that we originally intended to use. Can you explain what the self-sufficiency rule is that's a part of FHA loans and why it stops so many closings of small multifamily properties? The self-sufficiency rule is only when you're buying a triplex or a fourplex. Okay. So a single family and a duplex are not subject to this rule. But the general rule, and this is only with FHA loans, all of the rents for the combined units. So if you're buying a triplex, it's all three units and it's the rents determined by the appraiser. So let's say it's a three unit and it's $1,000 each, right? Each unit rents for a thousand bucks. So you have $3,000 of rent. They take 75% of that. That number needs to be greater than or equal to your mortgage payment. The problem with that is then in most markets, especially the one where this borrower was buying, the property prices are too high, right? So you're not going to get a triplex in California for $3,000 a month mortgage, right? It's going to be higher than that. That self-sufficiency rule, and that's not something where, you know, a lot of people ask, oh, well, if I make the income to make up for it, I don't need the property to cash flow. I'll just pay the difference. And like, while in theory, you are correct, in application on the FHA loan product, that is a hard stop. That is a, it's it's a yes or no, an approve or deny, right? And if that does not fill the, the requirement for the full coverage of the mortgage payment, full decline, you have to change loan products or find a different property, right? And in this borrower's case, Change loan products came to us. We got them the 5% conventional that did not have that rule. um, And it worked out very well for them. There you go. So not all that glitters is gold. It's very common in this industry to have somebody tell you, oh, why are you going with them when you could do this other person instead? I mean, you definitely don't want to turn down opportunities when people tell you about them, but you don't want to assume everything is great and that the grass is greener on the other side because it's often not. All right, let's get into example number three here. This would be another FHA error. So this was a person who was going to use an FHA loan to buy a property and came to us for a second opinion. And we were able to say, hey, did you realize that if you go forward with the FHA option here, there's going to be a cost to pay for that, that they were not aware of, that their lender did not explain to them. And we switched them over to a better loan product that would save them money. Go ahead and run with that one. Yeah. So this one, a little different than the self-sufficiency rule, because this was not a multifamily. This was just a single family property. If there is a negative with the FHA loan product, not only does it come with mortgage insurance that stays for the life of the loan, okay, that it comes in terms of a monthly payment on your mortgage. It also comes with what us in the industry know as UFMIP, upfront mortgage insurance premium. This is a very misunderstood fact with FHA loans. Not only do they come with a mortgage insurance premium in terms of a monthly payment, right, that adds on to your mortgage payment, they also come with an upfront expense. 
Okay. So if you guys have ever purchased with an FHA loan, go back to your closing disclosure, right? You'll not only see the estimates of your monthly payment, you'll also see a fee that you were charged up front. And it's typically around 1.8% of the loan amount. So it's a, it's a significant amount, right? A $500,000 loan, one eight, what that's like eight or $9,000. FHA loans are great for people with low credit scores who only have that three and a half percent who need a little bit more favorability with their debt to income ratio. But we saw this borrower and he qualified super easily for a conventional loan, putting 5% down. Well, if you guys do the math, three and a half percent down on an FHA loan, plus the one and a half percent fee that you pay is about 5%. However, with the FHA loan, that one and a half percent insurance premium is financed. That's why people don't know about it. What do I mean by that? Well, instead of giving you a loan, let's say for instance, you buy a loan, you have a hundred percent of the loan value to work for, you put three and a half percent down. That means your loan is for the remainder. Ninety six and a half percent of your house value is the loan you're getting. If you ever actually do the math with your FHA loan, though, you actually get closer to a ninety eight percent loan to value loan. It's because they finance that one point eight percent fee. Are you paying for it up front at closing? No, but it's added to your loan and you pay interest over that over the course of the loan, which actually increases the cost of it. So we saw this bar. We said, hey, man, you're great credit. You got good debt to income. You have the 5% in your bank account. Why don't we get you over into this loan product that not only is going to have a lower monthly payment because that mortgage insurance premium is less and it goes away right during the course of the loan and you don't have to pay this upfront fee in terms of increasing your loan amount, it's gonna be a better loan product for you and put you in a better position long-term, assuming you keep this house for you know five plus years. He saw the differences, we broke it down side by side. Absolutely the easiest choice was the conventional loan. Um, and we ended up saving that bar with thousands of dollars over the course of the first five years of his loan, which was a big win. So in many cases, the conventional loan option is better than the FHA. FHA is really flexible. That's where it can be good. If you have lower credit or maybe you get a better rate, there's times where FHA might work better, but people typically just see three and a half percent down or they hear someone say FHA is where you start. And no loan officer is going to come in and tell you, no, you should switch to something else because they want their job to be as easy as possible. So that's why you're here on Mortgage Mondays, learning what your options would be when you're talking to your loan officer. Ask them about all the costs associated with an FHA loan compared to a conventional loan. So the lesson here is that FHA isn't the only low down payment option. And oftentimes conventional ones, even though they sound like you're putting more money down, you're actually keeping more money in the equity of the property. Christian, for anybody who wants to reach out to you, talk with you, get put in touch with one of your loan officers, where's the best way for people to reach you? Yeah. So obviously if you want to reach me directly, the easiest way is on social media. Instagram's the best route. Um, at the one broker is my tag. If you want to directly apply to our company, our website is the one brokerage.com. Top right of the corner, click apply now. You'll get in touch with our team within five, 10 minutes from submitting that inquiry. There you go. And if you want to follow me, you could do so at davidgreen24.com or all my social media is LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, all of it is at davidgreen24. I've also written some books, which you can find at the Bigger Pockets bookstore. Head over to biggerpockets.com slash store. My newest one, Pillars of Wealth, is a Wall Street Journal best seller and basically describes a financial blueprint that anybody can use to become a millionaire. It's not flashy, it's not easy, but it's pretty much guaranteed to work. So if you want to build your wealth through real estate and you're trying to figure out how do I get the down payment, you can try to borrow it from somebody else. You can try to wheel and deal. You can try to find a property that doesn't require any money down, or you could just get good at making money and saving money and put that towards the house and walk a path that's much more likely to be successful. If you love this video, let us know in the comments what you thought about about it. Let us know what you'd like to see on future episodes of Mortgage Monday because we read them and we will run them into our future show scheduling. Make sure that you like, share, and subscribe this video. And if you've got a minute, check out another Bigger Pockets video. If not, we'll see you next Monday.